now that we've got that slice, those are local color, you know, the... Uh, uh, okay, so um, I'm going to tell you uh, why big data is low rank, um, using low rank models. So uh, I first got interested in this topic, um, actually before... Uh, oh, uh, I should wait. Great. Great. Um, I'm Madeline Udell. Uh, I'm going to tell you why big data is low rank using low rank models. Okay. Uh, so I've been using Julia since around 2012. And I actually got interested in this topic even before I started using Julia. Um, this is back in 2011. I was working on Barack Obama's re-election campaign doing data analytics. And that was the first time that I saw a big, messy, really kind of horrible data table. Um, and this is what it looked like. Um, there was uh, one row for every voter in the United States. It's about 300 million rows. Um, and there was one column for everything we knew about them. And that included things like their... That included things like their age, uh, their gender, what state they were registered to vote in, um, maybe a, an approximation to their income, maybe we knew approximately their level of education, and things like what magazines they subscribe to, right? I mean, you can buy a lot of information about people, um, and, uh, you know, the campaign had bought it because they were trying to do, you know, their market research, right? Um, so we just wanted to do some basic sort of understanding of who these people were, right? There's some uh, uh, traditional ways of classifying voters into certain demographic groups, and we wanted to say, but can we actually learn that from the data? Can we learn what the right demographic clusters are from the data? Uh, and it turns out this is really challenging um, because these things aren't real numbers, and they're missing entries, right? Uh, I mean, age looks like a number, income looks a lot like a number, education level is not a number, this is an ordinal variable, um, state is a categorical variable, and so you have to ask yourself, if someone looked exactly the same except they were in two different states, two people looked exactly the same but in two different states, would that be more or less different than if these two people looked exactly the same except their income differed by $30,000? Okay, so we, how, do you, how do you process this? Um, and they're basic questions we wanted to answer, right? How do you detect demographic groups? How do you find typical responses for people in those groups? How do you identify related features, right? And how do you impute missing entries? Okay, so all these are hard because the data is uh, 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 heterogeneous and has missing entries. Okay, so uh, I went back to Stanford where I was doing my PhD and, you know, scratched my chin and thought about it for several years. Uh, uh, okay, so the first step, the first step if you're going to do this thing in academia is you, you generalize the problem. So you say, I don't just have a data table in politics. Let's suppose I just have M examples of any kind. Maybe these are patients in a hospital. Maybe they're respondents on a survey. Maybe they're assets in a financial model. Um, and I have things that I know about them. Maybe uh, the results of tests that I've administered, um, questions I have asked them, um, performance indicators in a financial model. Um, so the ith row, uh, so, so let's call this the um, data matrix A. The ith row of A is going to be the feature vector for the ith example, and the jth column will give values for the jth feature across all the examples. Okay. So uh, if we're going to make progress, we're going to have to make some assumptions. And here's the assumption um, uh, that we're going to make. Okay, so let's suppose that I've got this m by m data table. Um, I'm going to pick a number k that's much less than the number of rows and the number of columns. And what I'm going to look for is I'm going to find a real-valued matrix X and a real-valued matrix Y so that X times Y is approximately equal to A. Okay, so X times Y is a real-valued matrix that is uh, M by N. Okay, and I'm saying that that is approximately equal to A, but A is this data table with heterogeneous entries and missing values. Okay, so I'm going to have to explain to you what I can possibly mean by squiggly equals. But my claim is that, right, if we could find such a thing, it would be really great. Um, and the reason is, is that it answers all of the questions um, from the previous slide. Okay, so um, what this means is that there's a row of X for every example, and there's a column of Y for every feature. Okay, so you can think of X and Y as the compressed representation of this data table A. You can think of a row of X as being a point, a vector, associated with example I, and a column of Y um, being a point, a vector associated with feature J. So you could plot these, you could cluster these, 
right? You can visualize them, you can find the nearest one, right? And this helps you find what's the, what's the most similar, say, patient to my patient in the hospital, right? Or what's the most similar feature, right? If I didn't observe this test, what other tests might be good proxies, okay? Um, and last, the inner product, uh, which I'm gonna write as XIYJ, so XI is a row vector here, um, approximates AIJ, right? So if I have some missing entry, I wanna know what it was, I can impute it using the value XIYJ. Okay, so that's cool, now I have to explain squiggly equals, okay. But, uh, so, so once again, why? I'm doing this to reduce storage, maybe. Um, I'll store XY inside of the original data table A. Uh, I'll use this to understand my data, to visualize your cluster. I'll use it to remove noise, uh, maybe uh, the, the XY is actually better than my original data A. Um, I might be using it to infer missing data or to simplify data processing. Okay, by using these um, uh, vector representations of my examples instead of the original heterogeneous messy data. Okay, so the simplest, 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 oldest case of this um, general framework is principal components analysis. Okay, so this is a methodology that's been around for over 100 years. Um, and the idea is least squares, low rank fitting. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna imagine that my data table A is actually just a collection of real numbers and that I've observed them all, okay? And in that case, it makes sense to say, I'm gonna subtract from every element of A the corresponding element of X times Y um, and take the square of that difference. And I wanna find the X and Y that minimize the sum of the squares of those differences, okay? Um, so the reason, one of the reasons this has been around for so long it, is because there's almost an analytical solution by the S, SVD, okay, or eigenvalue decomposition. You can get it by the power method. If you actually look in the original um, paper by Hodling, um, he uh, forms the covariance matrix of his data table, which is four by four, and then he does power iteration to find its largest eigenvector by hand in the paper. Every iteration. He says, here's a random vector, here's what happens when we apply the covariance matrix once, here's twice, here's three times, ah, it looks about the same, we're converged. Okay, <laughs> great, okay, so that's very easy. Um, what's interesting is that sort of in the modern era, there's another way of doing this um, uh, that generalizes better to other problems, and that's alternating minimization. So pick an X, minimize the subjective over Y, that's a least squares problem, super easy. Now pick, fix that Y, minimize over X, also a least squares problem, also super easy. Okay, so you repeat this, go back and forth, minimizing over X and Y. Um, what's interesting unless, is unless you got extraordinarily unlucky, and by extraordinarily I mean measure zero, uh, that converges to the same solution that you would get by using the SVD. I'm sorry that this keeps turning off for unknown reasons. Um, I suspect it's a problem. Yeah. It let me, let me, no, it's not. No, it's not. Um, I'm going to try switching adapters. The adapter has been very reliable for me, so um, not surprising. Um, let's try it. No, 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 sorry, uh, there's a USB-C one, yeah. yeah, great. because I was having problems on the ports on this side, um, and now apparently I'm having, yeah. Okay. There are four ports, but switch computers. Yeah, what's strange is that I've, I've actually never had this, right? I project from this computer all the time. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I actually think, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can pull it down from uh, Dropbox. Yeah, because everything I'm already um, Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, something's happening. No. No, but it's 
being a... Do you have it, do you have it on the USB? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Can you send her the Dropbox link something that... Uh, yeah, yeah, I can, send, I, can, I can send you a Dropbox link. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, okay, so we know how to solve this via alternating minimization. Great. Okay, so now we can afford to generalize it. Okay. So um, we're going to generalize the PCA objective in three ways. One is that we're going to use a different uh, loss function. So rather than the least squares loss function, we're going to... Uh, Rather than the least squares loss function, um, we're going to use a sum of loss functions Lj. So there can be a different loss function for each column. And it's important that we're not subtracting Aij from Xiyj, um, because Xiyj is always a number. Yeah, we're going to have to move to a different computer. Um, yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, one moment. Okay, we're back. Okay, so we're going to generalize the PCA objective to find our XY that best fit our data table A. Um, we're going to generalize that PCA objective in three ways. Okay, one is instead of using the least squares loss function, we're going to use loss functions LJ that are adapted to the data types in each column. Okay, so um, we're not going to subtract AIJ from XIYJ. Um, because we would do so end up doing something like subtracting California from 7.2, which is not something you should do. Um, uh, right, so I'll tell you a little bit more about loss functions a bit later. Um, uh, the second way we're going to generalize is that we're going to add some regularizers uh, on the columns of uh, Y and on the rows of X. And these are going to ensure um, some kind of stability. Um, they can also help you uh, enforce interpretability, like they can give you a model that's already clustered or whose coefficients are non-negative. Um, the third generalization um, is maybe the most straightforward. Um, if we haven't observed all the entries in the data table, we're not going to write them down 
uh, in our objective. Okay, so we're just going to minimize the sum over the entries in the data table that we've observed, which is the, the index set omega. Um, once we've made these three generalizations, suddenly the objective can be NP hard to optimize exactly. Okay? Um, but it's still very easy to perform alternating minimization um, or uh, alternating proximal gradient method, which is what we do in low rank models. Um, this gets you down to minima that are pretty good, right, if not exactly optimal. Okay. Um, okay, so how does this work in low rank models? So in the package low rank models, we've implemented a huge variety of loss functions and of regularizers. Um, to make it very flexible so that you can use um, uh, uh, ones that, that really work for your problem. Um, there are also strong defaults. Um, so if you just say, uh, please fit me a low rank model, um, I want rank five, and uh, here are the data types in each of my columns, um, where the data types can be chosen from real, Boolean, ordinal, and categorical, um, then low rank models will choose you an objective function that's pretty good. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, here's some collection of these uh, loss functions. Quadratic loss is the most traditional. L1 loss um, is a little bit more robust. Um, the Huber loss combines the smoothness, which is useful for op optimization purposes, near zero, um, with robustness as you go farther out. So it looks like L1 far out and L2 um, towards the middle. Um, for Boolean, there's hinge loss and logistic. Um, uh, uh, for ordinal and categorical data, um, Two of, um, two of my favorites are the uh, one versus all loss um, and the bigger versus smaller loss. So one way that people will often treat categorical variables is they'll use a one-hot encoding. They'll say, I'll encode California as a vector that's 50 long um, and that has a one in the index that corresponds to California. Okay? And then to fit that, I'll treat that like a Boolean. Okay? So I'll try to predict that there's a one there and I'll try to predict that there's a zero everywhere else. Okay, so the one versus all loss effectively does that for you. Okay, so you don't need to you don't need to actually perform that expansion. It does something like that kind of inside. Uh, but what it means is that when you impute, it will give you a value that is between one and fifty, rather than uh, you know a two sparse or three sparse or five sparse vector that you don't know how to interpret. Okay, um, and the bigger versus smaller loss does the same thing for ordinal data. Um, regularizers, you choose regularizers to impose structure on your model for the most part, um, or a small amount of quadratic regularization can help with optimization. Um, so uh, usually if I don't know what to do, I'll choose a small amount of quadratic regularization. Um, and if I want a sparse model, I, I want the coefficients to be sparse so I'll be able to understand what they mean, I might use one reg, which is L1 regularization. Um, if I want them to be non-negative, I'll use the non-negative constraint. Um, and if I want them to be clustered, you can, um, uh, you can use the unit one sparse constraint to make sure there's exactly one one uh, in every row of x um, and the rest zeros. Um, and so you can interpret which uh, 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 the, the rows of x that have the same uh, sparsity pattern as being in the same cluster. Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, alternating minimization on, the, on a, uh, uh, an objective with a quadratic loss function and the, uh, what I'm calling the clustered uh, regularization here exactly reproduces the k-means algorithm. That's kind of cool. Okay, um, how do you impute missing data in this model? That's maybe the most important thing and the, 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 the biggest use case for low-rank models. Um, and this is very natural once you have this loss function formulation, right? If you're gonna fit your model by minimizing the loss function over the first slot, Right? You can impute missing data by minimizing the loss function over the second slot. Okay? So fixing x and y, I find the most likely value by minimizing over a. Okay? And since this loss function has a, a, a certain domain, right? A, right, a is expected to be maybe an integer, maybe an integer between 1 and 5, um, maybe a string, maybe a Boolean. Right? Um, and so the imputations have to also lie in that domain. Um, Okay, so um, when uh, the loss function is quadratic, L1, Huber loss, um, then uh, you'll, you'll find that the imputation you get is exactly equal to x, i, y, j, which sort of corresponds with people's intuition. Um, but if it's not, um, uh, for example, if you've got um, like the hinge loss or the logistic loss, um, when you minimize over A, the, the value you're going to get is going to be the sign of x, i, y, j. Right? So you'll get a you know, plus one 
um, if that value is positive and minus one if that value is negative. So you actually do get Booleans out of the imputation. Okay. So let's see how all this works. Um, let's suppose that I've got this uh, heterogeneous data table. Um, maybe this is data from a hospital. I mean, here we are, I guess, at a, a nursing school. Um, and uh, uh, so every row corresponds to a patient, and, and every, every column corresponds to a test that I've done. There, there's three, three different kinds of tests. Some of these tests give um, uh, continuous value uh, data, some give Boolean data, and some just give ordinal data, right? I've asked the patients, uh, thanks. I've asked the patients uh, what their uh, pain is on a level from uh, one to 10, okay? Um, but, but there's been a problem at the hospital. Um, it's kind of embarrassing, but our information system has lost um, half of the data for half of the patients. Okay, so what do we do now, right? Uh, I mean, you don't want to admit this to the patients. Uh, okay, so instead you do imputation, right? Um, let's see if we can fill in that missing data using um, other things that we know about the patients. Okay, so um, the first thing we might try is um, a PCA, which in this case, um, uh, means just using a, a quadratic loss function. Uh, so we're going to fit a, a, a low-rank model using a quadratic loss function to fill in the missing data. Here's the recovery I get, um, and this plots the error that I get here. Green is zero error. Everything that's not green is um, some error, in particular yellow is unit error. Um, so you see, like, the it's, it's, it's okay. It's not the worst. Okay? Um, uh, now, Okay, uh, now I can try using a loss function that's actually adapted to each kind of data. So here I'll use a Huber for the real value data, I'll use a uh, hinge loss for the Boolean data, and I'll use an ordinal hinge loss for the ordinal data. Um, and you see the error goes down substantially. Okay, so using a loss function that's adapted to the data really helps. Um, Uh, now, I was going to do a demo, but that's on the other computer, so um, I'm going to defer that to if we have time at the end, but that'll be up um, on the low rank models repository, um, let's say, in an hour after the talk. Okay. Great. Um, but, but I think the coolest thing is if, if you don't want to think about the loss functions, you don't want to think of anything, um, if you tell it, um, here's my data frame, um, it can be a data table, it can be a data frame, um, it could be sparse array, A. Um, here's the rank of the model that I want, say five, and here's an array of the data types of each of these columns, because you can't tell, right, if someone gives you like one, two, three, four, maybe they mean those actually as categoricals, and maybe they mean those as ordinals. So it's quite important to tell them, um, right, that, that in this case four is bigger than three, and three is bigger than two, but I don't know by how much, so that's ordinal, right, or four and three and two and one, those are just different, right, they're like different flavors of ice cream, there's no order, those are categorical, right. Or, I, no, no, I actually mean the numbers one, two, three, four. Okay, that's real value. <laughs> um, uh, okay, and then you fit the model. So, uh, uh, very easy. Okay, so um, one major question um, you should have at this point is like, how do I choose these parameters, right? How do I choose, uh, for example, the rank? How do I choose the amount of regularization? How do I choose the types of regularization? Um, and the most obvious answer is cross-validation. Okay, leave out some of your data, um, try fitting a model. Um, with whatever parameters you think might work well, um, and see how well you impute on the data that you left out. Okay. Um, so as a, a simple example here, I'm doing cross-validation on a data set that's really rank three in order to choose um, both the rank and the regularization parameter. And here you can see the error I get if I choose rank one or rank two is very bad. As long as I choose rank three or higher, the error is pretty good because it's sufficient to represent my data. Um, and... Uh, 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 and you can see that the, um, I get the best fit um, if the rank is exact and I use no regularization. If I use a rank that's a little bit too high, um, using a tiny bit of regularization really it helps me a little bit. Okay. So, so, so actually, uh, I think this is a, a kind of nice, it tells you it's not too sensitive to the rank as long as the rank is high enough. Okay. So it's not so hard to choose these parameters. Okay, uh, let me show you some real applications. That's more exciting. Okay, so uh, we actually did an, ex uh, 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 this is a work in collaboration with Nigam Shah at Stanford and Alejandro Schuler, who was the first author, is one of his students. Um, so I gave, I gave a talk that sort of contained the ideas in this, and Nigam heard it and he was like, I have patient data from a hospital. Let's see how well it works on my actual patient data from a hospital. 
Um, okay, so we took this hospitalization data set. Um, it contained um, information about patient demographics, diagnoses, procedures that had been done, and comorbidities, so other, um, uh, 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 other illnesses that they had. Um, and we tried fitting uh, models using, once again, the quadratic loss and also tailored loss functions that were adapted to the data type. Um, and what happened is, is that we got better and better predictions as the model rank increased. Okay, so that tells you that, um, and the errors are actually quite low. Okay, so um, that tells you that these, this patient data was approximately low rank, um, but uh, it got, you know, the fit got a little bit better um, as you went up higher in rank, so there was sort of enough data to fit a pretty complex model without overfitting. Um, but I thought that really the most interesting thing, so here you see the yellow stuff is PCA, so that's quadratic loss, um, and the blue and uh, 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 magenta lines are um, tailored, uh, tailored loss functions that are adapted to the data type. So you see, you do actually get much better imputations if you don't just use quadratic loss when your data is not actually real valued. Okay. Um, okay, let's see how to use this in order to um, improve machine learning models in order to actually augment um, uh, your data set. Um, so here, this is an example um, that comes from the uh, uh, U.S. Wage and Hour Division compliance actions. Okay, so here, here are some companies, and some of them have been committing violations of U.S. labor law. Okay, so uh, that's very bad because oftentimes the people whose rights are violated um, in those circumstances are not people who can take you to court. Right? You need to go. You need to go find. Okay, find out what's going on, um, and figure out you know where to where to place your enforcement efforts. Okay. So um, turns out, you know, the Holiday Inn and Lakeside Nursing Home are, you know, not being necessarily kind to their workers um, here in uh, 14850, which is where Cornell is located. Um, so in this data set, we've got um, 200,000 rows, 252 columns, so information about the violation. Um, but one piece of information that I think is very interesting is the zip code, okay? So zip code looks like a number. It's not a number, right? It's a categorical variable. Um, different zip codes are just, are, are different. I mean, there's some information about which one is close to each other geographically, but that doesn't necessarily tell you about which zip codes are more likely to um, have cultures in which people violate U.S. labor law, okay? Um, and there are 33,000 of them, okay? So how do you fit a model, what do you do when you see this like super high dimensional categorical variable? Like you think there's some information there, but you don't know how to get it out. Um, okay, I and mean, one thing that people might do is fit a different model for every zip code. That's going to work really badly here because we've got 33,000 zip codes, 200,000 rows. So that means in every zip code, even if they were split evenly, uh, what, we've had like eight. Um, okay, that's not enough cases to fit a model with 252 columns. Okay, you could try expanding this out to a, a one-hot vector. Um, and that's also, um, I'll, I'll, show you, uh, I'll show you what happens when you do that. It doesn't work super well. It also re it really increases the number of variables in your model, and now suddenly the number of variables in your model is almost the same um, as the number of uh, examples you have. So you're not going to be able to fit well without overfitting. Okay, so what do you do? Um, okay, uh, low rank models to the rescue. Um, but first, okay, first, um, find another data set. Find another data set that has your high dimensional categorical variable as, um, as uh, 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 like the primary key. Okay, so here, um, I, we went and pulled up some data from the census, okay? And the census will tell you lots of things about every zip code. Okay, so they'll tell you like the unemployment rate, the mean income, the quality of the schools, the crime rate. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and all this encodes like a lot about the culture of that zip code. Okay, but this is a lot of information. It's not clear, you know, if we need to add this much information to our model. Um, right, so one, one sort of simple idea might be, um, I'll replace the zip code by this collection of all these other things that I know about the zip code, right? Um, and maybe that's a good way of featurizing the zip code. So I'll also show you, um, uh, sort of trying that model. Um, but there's a third idea, which is to use a low rank model to embed these zip codes into a lower dimensional space. Okay, so I'll fit a low rank model to predict, in fact, this data table. Okay, um, if I do this with a rank two model, then the resulting features that I, uh, 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 the resulting data vectors that I get for every row, so that's for every zip code, are two dimensional, and that means I can plot them. Okay, so I plotted just a couple, so it doesn't get uh, uh, too complicated. So you can see, 
Um, for example, uh, Cupertino and Sunnyvale, which are two uh, uh, cities in Silicon Valley, are pretty close to each other. And you should think about this is like demographic space. Okay, right? These are um, the coordinates that best predict all this stuff from the census. Okay, so this is a kind of abstract notion. Okay, but the Cupertino and Sunnyvale are pretty similar. Um, East Harlem is kind of uh, as far away as you can get from McCune, which is a small town in Kansas. Um, uh, you know, the Upper East Side is kind of closer to Salt Lake City than it is to Cupertino. You know, it's not clear. Okay, we we can you know try to interpret this stuff, but it's it's it's, it's not entirely clear. Um, so we tried doing this into 10 dimensions, okay? So we got 10 dimensional zip code features. And now we're gonna run a comparison, okay? So we're building three sets of features to predict these labor code violations. One is categorical, so I'm expanding the zip codes to a one hot vector with 33,000 possible uh, values. Um, one is concatenating, I'm gonna join those tables on zip code, so I'll replace the zip code by that entire list of 252 features from the census. And the third is to use a low rank model to find these 10 dimensional features that best describe that census data. Okay. Um, and if I do this and then fit a, a supervised like, deep learning model on these features, um, here's what I find. Um, okay, so number one, if I expand to a categorical variable, my runtime goes way, way up. Okay. Um, in training error, um, I get a uh, lower training error using the categorical model than the concatenated model. That's not surprising because it's easier to overfit when I've got <laughs> 33,000 extra features. Um, but actually, the low rank model is even better than that. Okay? Um, and in test error also, um, the low rank model is performing um, better than um, either of the other models. And you do see that both of the other models are overfitting to a greater extent. Okay? Uh, so this is kind of interesting, right? We've, we've captured fewer features, but they're actually more informative. Um, and what I think is going on here is that these 10 dimensional features are doing a lot of denoising. Okay, there's a lot of randomness in these 252 features that I collected from the data, and it's not possible to fit both the signal and the noise. So the low rank model just gets the signal, um, and then you can use that in your, in your subsequent machine learning. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, at this point in my research career, I started getting kind of cocky, okay? And I was like, what, what can't low rank models do? Like, let's just like, you know, what, like, what's your like pie in the sky, like thing you'd really like to be able to predict? Okay, so, um, okay, so we started trying it for automated machine learning, and let me show you how that goes. Okay, um, given, uh, let's suppose that you've got a collection of M data sets, and you've got uh, N machine learning models, okay? So these might be things like uh, one machine learning model might be uh, random forests with uh, 100 different trees and each tree has maximum depth three, okay? And then another one is a random forest with, uh, with 200 trees and each tree has maximum depth seven, okay? So you can imagine generating a lot of models this way. One is lasso, one is uh, linear regression, one is, uh, uh, you know, standard decision trees, whatever, okay. So you can generate a lot of different machine learning models this way. Um, everything in scikit-learn, say. We're gonna measure the error of every model on every data set. Okay, this takes a while, this takes a while, um, but you can do this offline, right? Our goal is that when a new person comes in with a new data set, we should be able to give them a good model fast. Okay, so we're gonna do this all offline. Collect information about the world of machine learning. Um, from this, we're going to form an M by N data table A. Okay, so the rows correspond to data sets, the columns correspond to models. And we've observed every element in here. Um, okay, now we're going to fit a low rank model. Okay, so we're going to find uh, an X and Y that's approximately equal to that data table A. Um, and here, you, you can actually just do this by PCA. Uh, that works perfectly well. Okay, so now we've got a sort of low dimensional representation for every data set and a low dimensional representation for every machine learning model, right, in the column of Y. Okay, what happens when a new data set comes along? Well, we don't know how any of the machine learning models perform on that new data set. We also know, don't know its data set representation in this low dimensional space. Okay, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, let's say we collect just a little bit of data, right? We run three of these machine learning models on that new data set. Uh, from that, we can just solve a least squares problem to figure out what its row of x should look like, okay? Um, and from that row of x, now we can do imputation, right? So all of those, the question marks, um, uh, we can fill in just using uh, that row of x times the matrix y, okay? 
So now we've got guesses for everything, uh, for how well all of the machine learning models perform on this new data set. I should, uh, it should be closer. Ah, excellent, okay. Uh, apologies to the people viewing this by live streaming. Um, okay, so you can think of these rows of X as data set meta features, columns of Y as model meta features, and X times Y are predicted performances on this new data set. Okay, so let's see how well this works. Um, here, um, what I'm gonna show you is the, uh, the uh, uh, so as a function, so say I pick the top five predicted entries in a given row of A, um, what's the likelihood that those contain the correct algorithm type, okay? Um, uh, uh, and uh, as the rank of my model increases, the likelihood that those contain the correct algorithm type increases. Also, as the number I pick increases, right? But, but actually, by the time I get to even rank, um, you know, 15, I'm predicting correctly more than 90% of the time if I, if I look at the, first, the top five entries, okay? Well, that's pretty good. Okay, so um, uh, there's one, um, one other sort of critical ingredient here, um, which is which machine learning models should I actually measure? Which ones are gonna be the most informative? And which ones will run fast enough that I can, um, that I can actually use that information uh, uh, quickly enough? Um, so uh, uh, here what we did is we, um, uh, so first found a proxy for um, the, uh, the amount of information that you would get by running a certain collection of machine learning models. Um, and this proxy actually comes from very traditional ideas in, in uh, 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 classical ideas in experiment design, um, uh, where you're running linear experiments that give you linear information about your, about your, um, uh, 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 an underlying latent vector. Um, so this, this, this is minimizing some scalarization of the variance of your estimator um, under that linear model. Um, and, uh, and you can do this subject to constraints. So one constraint might be that the sum of the um, estimated times that will take us to uh, fit each of these models is less than some max time tau, okay? Um, so subject to a runtime budget. So we can find the most informative models subject to a runtime budget um, by, by rounding the results of this convex program, which you could solve, say, using convex.jl. Okay. Um, when you do this, I, so you get, a, you get in a sort of entire model for um, time-constrained um, uh, uh, automated machine learning. Okay, so as a function of the runtime budget, um, how good are the predictions that you're able to make? Um, so here, um, our system is called OBO. Um, uh, it's in red. Um, a state-of-the-art system called um, Auto SK Learn is in blue. Um, and uh, a version that's similar to OBO but uses um, random, runs random models rather than models selected by this experiment design procedure uh, is in green, okay? So you can see that um, Actually, the, the sort of most interesting thing here is that Auto SK Learn doesn't even return anything sensible um, until 16 seconds have elapsed, and these are relatively small data sets, so 16 seconds feels like a, a little bit of a long time. Um, uh, whereas OBO is able to return reasonable machine learning models even in one second. Okay. Um, you scale up the data sets, and suddenly these times, these times all scale up proportionally. Um, and then even at, at long times, OBO is doing um, about as well as the state-of-the-art method, even though it's a dead simple system, okay. Okay, so this gets super, super weird, right? Um, why in the world are the performances of all models on all data sets low rank? Okay, uh, uh, um, so I, we started thinking about this. Um, can we actually provide an explanation in general, okay? Why, um, why are so many data sets low rank? Okay, so, uh, ah, the mic needs to come up again, thank you. Um, okay, so let's suppose that our data table, here's a, here's a relatively general model that, that I'm kind of comfortable thinking is a, a reasonable generative model for many of these examples. Let's suppose that my uh, data table is generated by a latent variable model, by which I mean there's some vector corresponding to every row, um, which I'll call alpha i, and then there's some vector um, beta j corresponding to every column, um, and these might be relatively high dimensional vectors, okay? Coming from some arbitrary sets. I'm not gonna say what they are, okay? Um, and my entries are observed by running these representations through some function, okay? So uh, one example of this, right? A representation, you know, uh, alpha i for a data set is actually the entire data set. A representation beta j for the uh, machine learning model is the code of that model, okay? And this function could be uh, you know, uh, uh, scikit-learn, 
Okay, so, 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 so this is, uh, you can instantiate this model. Okay, um, let's get some examples. So if alpha i and beta j um, actually come from low dimensional vector spaces, say rk, um, and the function is the inner product, okay, then what you get is exactly a low rank model, right? The rank of a is exactly k. Okay, that's the easy case. Um, now, uh, what if you come to, let's talk about a slightly more complicated model. Let's suppose that alpha i and beta j are univariate, okay? Um, and uh, we run it through some function g. Can you say anything about what the rank of a is? Okay, so this is harder. It actually could be large. It could be full rank. Um, what's maybe more interesting is that if g is analytic, um, you can bound the rank of an entrywise epsilon approximation to A. Okay, if you want to approximate every entry of A within epsilon, you can do this with a model that has rank um, that grows as log of one over epsilon. So that's very slow. Okay, so for large enough matrices, the rank is going to be quite low. Okay. Now, can we can we you know relax some of these assumptions? So. Um, we can, we can relax some of them. So let's suppose that instead um, the distributions A and B, um, they could still be arbitrarily high dimensional, but they have bounded support. And let's suppose that G is piecewise analytic and then one other condition that I'm not going to talk too much about, okay? Um, but but, but it, it, it's pretty weak, okay? Okay, so um, if we do this, how does the, um, let's suppose that we get a matrix that's drawn from section model. Um, how does the rank of an epsilon approximation to A change with the number of rows and the number of columns, right? So I'm not saying it's going to be low rank if I take a 30 by 30 problem, if I take 30 data sets by 30 machine learning models. But what if I look at something that has, I don't know, 200 data sets by 200 or, or 2,000 by 2,000 or a million by a million, right? Is that going to look more and more low rank or is the rank just going to, you know, increase arbitrarily? Okay. So the answer is that the rank grows as the log of the number of rows plus the number of columns, okay? So as the data set gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the rank is growing, but it's growing much slower than the ambient dimension. And so it's looking more and more relatively low rank. Okay. And that means that you know, all your sort of imputation methods are going to work um, um, pretty well. So uh, we say uh, 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 the, the, the theorem statement is that nice latent variable models are of log rank, but colloquially uh, I say that this theorem shows that big data is low rank. Okay, um, I think we're, I have a proof sketch, but that's not, uh, I, I think, I think I'll, I'll save that for afterwards for people who are really excited. Um, what's cool is that you can actually prove this, um, you can prove this just using Taylor expansion um, uh, together with the Johnson London Strauss lemma. It, it's a pretty simple proof. Okay, um, so what have we shown? Um, uh, I've shown you some examples uh, suggesting that big data is low rank. Um, in uh, social science, um, in medicine, and in machine learning. Um, and I've shown you how to exploit low rank in order to fill in missing data, reduce the dimensionality of data sets, and in some sense turn big messy data into small clean data by using these low dimensional featureizations of your examples. Um, I'm told that I have four minutes left. Um, so we could try switching back to my other computer and I can show you a little demo. Um, okay, so let, let, let's do that. The demo I won't wander. <laughs> if okay, so let's see if this computer connects. Okay. Here's a super quick demo of, uh, of uh, the functionality in low rank models, okay? So here we're going to use low rank models along with some other um, useful tools. Um, uh, here's some uh, loss functions. So here's how you make a loss function. I'm going to instantiate the quadratic loss function, okay? Um, I could evaluate that loss on uh, 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 
uh, between uh, uh, imputed value 2 and real value 4, okay? Um, and 2 minus 4 squared is 4, so I get 4, right? Whereas the loss between, um, say, imputed value 1 and real value 2 um, is 1. Great, okay? Um, now, uh, uh, so, so in the same way, you can also compute, um, you can also compute gradients. So uh, these are the, the things that you have to implement for a new loss function if you want to add one, or evaluation methods and, and, and gradients. Um, okay, regularizers. So um, here are some examples. You could make a non-negative constraint, or you could make a quadratic regularization scaled by a value 5, okay, by putting the um, uh, 5 here in parens. So I'm going to generate these uh, regularizers. If I evaluate the non-negative constraint at 1, well, 1 is non-negative, so I'm going to get 0. Um, if I evaluate the non-negative constraint at negative 1, well, negative 1 is negative, um, and I'm going to penalize that infinitely, okay? So I get infinity, okay? Uh, I could evaluate the L2 constraint at 1, um, and this L2 constraint was scaled by 5, so this is like 5 times 1 squared, which is 5. Um, I evaluate it at negative 2, that's 5 times negative 2 squared, that's 20. Great, we can do arithmetic. Okay, um, how do we make a generalized low rank model? Okay, uh, let me show you an example. So here I'm generating it um, uh, by choosing loss functions and regularizers by hand. Okay, so I'm going to generate a data matrix, and this is a random low rank um, data matrix, and I'm going to look for a non negative factorization with rank 5. Okay, so I'll use a quadratic loss and a non-negative constraint. Um, I'm going to take a random set of 100 observations, which is one half of the entries here. Okay, and here's how I form a low-rank model. Okay, I say I want a generalized low-rank model uh, with uh, data table A. Um, my loss is going to be the quadratic loss from above, the non-negative regularizer on both X and Y, and rank K. And my observation set is omega. Okay. Uh, so I'll run this, that generates the low rank model. And now to fit the model, I call fit generalized low rank model. And it returns to me uh, the x, the y, and the convergence history, ch. Okay? Um, so if I want to know if it converged, I can plot the objective function, okay? Which is in the convergence history. Uh, now it's plotting, 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 plotting. Thanks, Julia, plotting, plotting, plotting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so you can see the objective converges down super fast in the first couple of iterations, um, uh, and then converges uh, slower from then on. Um, I can look at x and y, and indeed, they are both uh, uh, non-negative. So I, I did, in fact, enforce my non-negative constraint. That's great. Um, to find a better approximation, you know, maybe I could try restarting the iteration, because I could have gotten stuck in a local minimum. That can happen. This is a non-convex model. Um, you could try running for more iterations. You could also um, restart it at a random point um, because it, right, you might get caught in a local minimum. Um, but there is an initialization that works very well, and that's initialization using the SVD. Okay? So we've got this init SVD function. Um, let's try initializing the SVD and then fitting the low rank model. Um, if we do this, you can see um, if we initial. Uh, so for this, I guess I should um, uh, decrease the size again. Um, if I initialize with, uh, right, so the red is the convergence curve that I got from before. The blue is if I initialize with the SVD, okay? So it starts much lower, and it gets to a much lower local minimum, okay? And that happens most of the time. The SVD is kind of magic. It's, it's essentially the only non-convex problem that we can exactly solve. Um, so, you know, use what you know. Um, if I want to impute the entries from this model, um, I can call impute on the generalized low rank model. And it gives me um, imputations for every entry. That includes imputations enter for the entries that I actually saw. Okay? So if I thought that they were noisy, maybe I would prefer these imputations. Okay? But if I only want imputations for the entries that were missing, I can call impute missing. Great. Okay. Um, and I can look at the difference in that, that the zeros in that difference are exactly the observed entries. Okay. Uh, there are a bunch of different ways of calling this. I'm just going to show you um, two super quickly. Um, I could generate a sparse matrix, um, and uh, uh, low-rank models will assume that the structural non-zeros are missing entries. Okay, so if I call uh, GLRM on this sparse matrix, it's going to um, uh, fit it as though the structural zeros were missing entries, and not ignore those zeros. Okay, um, I can impute from those. Uh, 
It's also it's possible to treat different columns differently, to choose a different loss function for each column. This is super important for fitting heterogeneous data, which is the main um, uh, thing that we're excited about. Um, and uh, so here's, uh, this is an example on uh, fitting a data frame. So if I've got a data frame, some things are floats, some things are ints, um, in this case they're ordinals, and some things are booleans. Um, I can uh, uh, create this list of data types, right, one for every column that tells me what kinds of things they are. Uh, I fit a low rank model uh, on this data frame, say with rank three, using this list of data types. Notable is that I don't have to tell it loss functions and regularizers or scalings for any of these. It's gonna find all of these automatically. That doesn't mean it'll find the best ones, but it's, it'll find decently good ones, okay? Um, and once again, so I can, I form this low rank model, uh, I initialize it with the SVD and I fit it, I get relatively good imputations. Um, so let's end there, and I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Categorical data versus yes. other, you know, you know, uh, ordinal data versus yes. other types. That the sort of setting up the loss functions is a really key step. One yes. of the things that I wonder about: Do you have a good solution to the problem of scaling of the individual ones? Ah. You're, you're well familiar with this, but yes. just so people understand, you know, one a, a difference of one in your age is probably more important than a difference of one in your annual income, right? Yes. So that's right. That's right. I, I like to give the right. If you if you measured a distance in millimeters and you measured some other distance in kilometers. Uh, you, you probably don't want to be uh, penalizing the decision to be re uh, measured in millimeters by a factor of uh, 10 to the sixth more. Um, so, uh, uh, there my suggestion, so the standard suggestion for PCA um, is to um, uh, standardize your data, which means um, uh, uh, centering it so it has mean zero um, and dividing by the, uh, the, the variance so that it has variance one. Okay, um, there's an analog to this for low rank models and that is actually the default scaling that's implemented. Um, there's a, there's a, a keyword argument that you can use to, to ask for this. So we have a generalization of that for um, these more generic loss functions. Demeaning, um, uh, demeaning is like um, finding the one single value that best fits all of your loss functions in a given column. Um, and uh, standardizing, uh, uh, dividing by the variance is like um, uh, uh, scaling down your loss function by a factor that's one over the error of that um, uh, of that, uh, that that sort of single number estimator. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does that mean though then that low rank model still rewards redundancy in your data set then basically? Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Even if yes, you had right, one so column deals, very so predictive. With, yes. So that deals with the problem of the different columns being very differently scaled. Um, if you have uh, you know 200 columns that are essentially the same thing. Um, and then three columns that are different and are actually the sort of important parts of your signal, uh, then yeah, you're gonna reward, and, and you essentially can't get beyond that unless you're in a supervised learning setting. Um, so um, there are really nice ways to extend this to a supervised learning setting. Essentially, um, you, you trade off like how much do you wanna fit this whole data table and how much do you actually wanna fit this thing that you're trying to predict. Um, there are ways of doing that even sort of in the context of this package, but um, that we can talk about later. <coughs> Hello, thank you for the nice presentation. So I have two questions for you. First one that you use a PCA, principal component analysis for uh, future selections, right? Did you apply any kind of uh, future ranking like information gain or gain ratio or delta gain index? So uh, you, s you talk about the high dimensional data. So did you apply in your research that uh, any kind of future ranking matters like uh, gain ratio or information gain? Uh, this is in order to figure out which which columns to leave in, or say for example, uh, you talk about the PCA. Yes. So, uh, did you apply any kind of? Uh, uh, I mean, gain are you talking about like a, a BIC and AIC? Say for uh, example, let's say say, say for example, rank? from the data, if you want to build a tree, decision tree, uh -huh. uh, decision tree model. So, what it do actually? It select the best node from yep. the uh, fee, uh, uh, root node for uh, which is actually uh -huh. best splitting attribute. Yeah. So did you apply or compare uh, the approach with uh, PCA with other uh, uh, attribute selection methods like gain ratio? So, so, so uh, I, I, 
I'm, uh, I think the short answer is, is uh, that there are lots of ways of doing imputation and there are lots mm -hmm. of ways of solving any of these problems. Right. Uh, so, I don't know the one that you're talking about, so maybe we can discuss this offline. Okay. And the second question is like, you talk about automated learning. Is it like a meta learning? Say for example, uh, we uh, have- The alternating minimization? Or are you Auto talking about the AutoML? AutoML, yes, yes, yes. This is absolutely, uh, AutoML goes by the name meta learning as well. Right, right. So one of my students is currently working with me, like they say, for example, we have a couple of data sets and we have a number of machine learning algorithms. So what we do actually, initially we uh, get the results, like accuracy, position yeah. recalls and... So, 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 so right. once again, I think there are a ton of AutoML methods. Mm -hmm. um, they have really different operating principles. I think it's a it's a really young um, and exciting field. I'm, I would love to hear about yours offline, but but I think we should, uh, <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, actually, uh, maybe uh, one quick comment related to that is that I am looking for uh, people who want to work on AutoML, um, supervised learning, and a lot of problems on imputation related to these. So if you're interested in doing that as either a PhD student or a postdoc or possibly even um, a software developer, um, please come talk to me. We've got openings at all levels. <laughs>